Hey guys, what's up? Kelvin here. Today we're going to be looking at a BGP feature known as BGP Dynamic Neighbors. So this isn't found in uh, the CCNA or the CCMB Enterprise Certification. It's found in the CCA Enterprise Infrastructure Certification for the Enterprise Check. And it's also found in the CCNP Service Provider, uh, Service Provider Advanced Routing Exam or SPRI. And so today we're going to be covering why you would want to use BGP Dynamic Neighbors and what problem it's looking to solve. So in the last video, which was about regular expressions, I kind of promised that A, I would make a video about regex next, I believe, and B, that I would make more videos. So clearly both of those were a lie because this is a BGP video coming a month afterwards. I'm super sorry about that. I ended up being way busier than I expected. And with school coming back up and all that, I don't expect to be any less busy. So uh, I'm not going to promise to be on a super, super regular upload schedule. I'm going to try to get some sort of schedule going so I can start pushing videos out again and get back into the flow of things. But yeah, with that out of the way and without further ado, let's get into why you would want to use BGP Dynamic Neighbors. So firstly, before we get into that, I want to go ahead and touch on how an IGP like OSPF does its neighbor discovery. EIGRP does something similar, uh, RIP not because RIP doesn't do neighborships. But if you are already familiar with how OSPF does this multicast discovery, because there's just, just going to be a review of that, and you want to skip to the part of the video that ha starts with BGP dynamic neighbors, uh, you can go ahead and look for the timestamps in the description below. I'll have that clearly outlined just in case you want to skip this. But anyway, to get on with the explanation, Let's say that we have these three routers right here, and they're in the same OSPF domain, right? So they're on the same Ethernet segment. So how do these three routers become aware of each other? Well, they become aware of each other using multicast hellos. So in OSPF, you have these hello messages that are broadcasted to 224005, basically saying, hey, I exist on this Ethernet segment. And at layer two, those multicasts are going to be flooded. So R1, when it sends a multicast hello down to the switch, the switch is going to say, oh, all right, well, I'm just going to flood it out to everyone else, right? So it's going to flood it out here and here. And something similar will happen for R2 and R3's hello, so I'm not going to draw it out. The point is that after all of the hellos have been exchanged, R1, R2, and R3 will all be aware of each other. Now they may not form full adjacencies because of how OSPF only forms adjacency, full adjacencies with the DR and BDR on the segment, and obviously not everyone's going to be voted as a DR and BDR, but the point is that even DR others will be in two-way with each other, right? They will recognize each other's hellos, just not go further with the database exchange process. But they will at least, again, be aware of each other's presence because of these multicast hellos. So in LSPF, the point I wanted to make here was that these hellos are being flooded out into the domain and they're being multicasted out. So let's go ahead and think about how BGP traditionally does its peering. So let's go ahead and say in this case that we want R1 and R2 to peer each other. So you can see the necessary config to make that happen. Now let's say that on R1, because we want to be lazy and not configure as much, you know, what if we just did neighbor um, statements on R1, but we just created the uh, BGP process for AS2 on R2 and hit end? Like we did not configure the statement right here. What would happen? Well, R1 would do the uh, initiation of the TCP three-way handshake, would send out a TCP synchronization message over to R2, and R2 would in turn throw a TCP reset back in R1's face. Essentially, because R2 isn't just going to open up a TCP session with anybody, it needs to have a neighbor statement already predefined before it opens up that TCP session and forms the PGP peering. So the problem with this is twofold. The first problem um, is that in a large BGP environment, that's a lot of neighbor statements. Now there are features in place that will help you to reduce the amount of configuration required. Things like peer groups and templates and neighbor groups on iOS XR. Those things work, but at the core of it, you're still just creating a bunch of neighbor statements. You're just reducing the amount of configuration you need for stuff like eBGP multi-hop and update sources and uh, ORF prefix lists and stuff like that. 
you're just reducing that configuration, but at the end of the day, the core problem is still there. You have a bunch of neighbor statements for a bunch of IPs. The second thing that's wrong with that is that imagine if you not only have a large BGP environment where you need a lot of peerings, but imagine if you're adding more and more peerings by the day. You know, if you're a service provider and R1 is your provider edge and you've got customer edges that are constantly being onboarded and constantly have to form a BGP peering, that's a bit of a problem because R1 needs to be constantly updated with neighbor statements as you onboard new CEs, and those CEs need configuration themselves to activate the BGP process in the form of peering. So you can see that the core problem here is just that we need to have individual neighbor statements for each peering on each router, and that causes a lot of configuration overhead that we need to be able to avoid. So with BGP Dynamic Neighbors, we can help avoid that. You may see BGP Dynamic Neighbors as a title of this video and say, oh, I didn't know BGP could do neighbor discovery. I didn't know BGP could be like OSPF or EIGRP and multicast how to get network and with hello messages or in BGP's case, open messages and you know discover its neighbors. That, that helped me so much. I could eliminate my neighbor statements. Thanks, Calvin. Not so fast, because that's not exactly how BGP Dynamic Neighbors works. BGP Dynamic Neighbors does not do neighbor discovery. And you may be thinking, well, um, how is it doing dynamic neighborships? Then if it's not discovering a neighbor, you're still doing a static neighborship, right? Well, not quite, because the meaning of dynamic neighbors in this case is different than how an IGP would define a dynamic neighbor. An IGP would de uh, define a dynamic neighbor as, hey, I went out, I used my hello messages, and I discovered this person. Right? With BGP, you, it's it's a form of discovery, but it's not you know multicasting out to a segment type of discovery. It's a passive discovery. And an um, analogy can be made to how Ether Channel works. So with Ether Channel, how that works is it will do um, you know, if you've got LACP, right, you've got two modes, you've got active and you've got passive, right? So if you are going to define an ether channel, right, you have to put one side as active and put one side as either active or passive, right? It doesn't matter because your active side is going to begin an initiation. Now let's say that we put one side on active, one side the ether channel on active, and the other side the ether channel on passive. What's going to happen? Well, that first side is going to initiate the ether channel. It's going to send out LACPDUs, and that passive side only when it receives those LACPDUs is it going to reciprocate and respond with LACPDUs. Same thing with BGP dynamic neighbor. Same sort of principle. So. Dynamic neighbors is a form of discovery in the sense that as a router, you're just kind of sitting back and waiting for someone else to unicast you a BGP open message. So BGP will always unicast it, never multicasts, right? So as a router, when you're configured with uh, BGP dynamic neighbors, you're just kind of sitting back, uh, you know, kicking back in your flip flops, drinking, you know, whatever you drink, and you're just waiting for someone to come to you with an open message. You're waiting for someone who is configured with you as their static neighbor to uh, actively reach out to you, right? So there's a comparison to each channel active. You're waiting for them to actively reach out to you with an open message. And then when you see that open message, you're gonna say, huh, this matches my configuration for dynamic neighbors because as you'll see later in another video, uh, dynamic neighbors is configured with the subnet. So it's gonna check the subnet of the incoming open message against that subnet you have configured in the dynamic neighbors. And if it matches, then it's like, oh, okay, well this matches my configuration. You know, time to get off my butt and actually send back an open message as unicast, right? It's very, very similar to how Ether channel works with its active passive system. So let's just really quickly go ahead and apply that concept. So let's go ahead and configure our one year to be the router with the dynamic neighbor configuration. So because of how dynamic neighbors works, it's pretty much in nature designed to work with hub and spoke topologies, right? Because you've got this one router that everyone's peering with. So that's why I say that dynamic neighbors is in nature designed for hub and spokes. So as you can see here, say that I have this circled router 
as our uh, hub, the one that's configured with a dynamic neighbor. So now you, here you have your spoke routers. So these routers are going to be configured with static neighbor segments. So they're going to be configured uh, regularly, the same way that you would configure your static neighborship just without dynamic neighbors, right? This exact same way. The only special configuration takes place here on this router right here, on the router that you actually want to accept these dynamic neighborships on. So uh, this would be applicable to something like a DMVPN situation where you're constantly adding new spoke sites and you just need to be able to quickly um, deploy those and provision those with the, with the necessary BGP configurations without having to go back to your hub and configure that. So I hope that this overview of the general concept of BGP dynamic neighbors helped you to understand what it is, why you would use it, and the differences between it and how IGPs like OSPF and EIGRP and ISIS do their multicast discovery and dynamic neighborships. So in the next two videos, I'm going to cover how to configure this in iOS and iOS XE as well as iOS XR, um, which has a different configuration syntax, which is why I'm not bundling the first video. If you like this video, go ahead and drop a like below. If you want to subscribe to the channel and get notified when a new video comes out so you don't miss a thing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that bell uh, next to it. If you want to leave a comment with any suggestions, any feedback, questions, just saying that I love to hear from the community, go ahead and drop a comment down below. I try to respond to every single comment if I can. And yeah, have fun. More Cisco!